Hello, everyone. Greetings and welcome, everyone, to this, our 10th episode of the Invisible Museum Tour. My name is Jeff Olson, and I am the Art Education Director for Royal Talents North America. Today's show is sponsored by Royal Talents and Blick Art Materials. We would like to thank the folks at Blick for joining us today and for their upcoming and ongoing support of this wonderful art educational programming. Now let me introduce our host. She is a graduate of the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles and received her Master of Fine Arts at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Her work is featured in numerous prominent and private collections around the world. And she is the recipient of many awards, including the Alex Award in Visual Arts. She's an art historian and educator working for over a decade at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. She's the co-founder of the nonprofit Project AWE, A-W-E, on a mission dedicated to exploring connections between Western esotericism and the arts. And if that wasn't enough, folks, she is also the founder of the Z Academy, where she mentors students of all ages. Everybody join me in welcoming the incomparable Genia Gershman. Genia, how are you? Hello, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me back. Thank you, Blick, for sponsoring our event today. And thank you for everyone, thousands of people around the world that have been watching. Today's somewhat a celebration because it is our 10th episode and that's just a big undertaking in a little bit over a year, I think, or maybe even under a year that we've been uh, able to achieve. So thanks to you, everybody who watches. Uh, the show keeps going. It's an, a free educational program. So please share it. And, and we really appreciate your support. So today um, for a celebration, we chose Goya. And Goya as an artist probably doesn't need any introductions. He is considered, uh, some people call him the last of the classical tradition and the first of the modern tradition. He's really a bridge between then and now. It's impossible to think about painting without Goya. So I'm going to start to share my PowerPoint. So let me do that real quick. And we'll go on the journey. Share, let's see, just one quick, one quick stop. Share screen, here it is, share, all right. And got our launch it. Okay, here we go, oops. All right, so to officially introduce Goya, Francisco, Francisco Jose de Goya y Licientes. And so for short, we call him Goya, otherwise it would be too hard to remember. And uh, what makes him really difficult is that Thank God he lived a very long life, 82 years uh, for this time period, for 18th century, quite a long period. But what makes it really difficult is that he went through so many changes in his life and his art. And to be able to fit it into about an hour is really difficult, but also very exciting. So I try to divide um, Goya's career into periods that will be interesting to follow. But also, I would say, I try to divide his life for you today into a series of contradictions, because Goya is full of contradictions. And he lives through um, things like success at the court, uh, love and passion, uh, horrible brutality of war and death, um, terrible illness, and ends up with sarcasm and falling apart health through which he does some of his strongest work. So full, life full that we go about to follow together. So we begin with a self-portrait. And what's amazing about it, um, in a great tradition of self-portraiture, he shows himself at an easel. Well, I would say it's hard to even to say at an easel because it's a monumental painting that he's painting, that he's propped against the easel. And what's really amazing about it is that he's not wearing a painting outfit. Um, and uh, I think probably Jeff knows and recognizes this costume. Jeff, does it look familiar? I think it's a bullfighter's costume. <laughs> 
you are correct. So, <laughs> so that gives you a little bit of a personality, right? I mean, last time, Jeff, did you put on your, I mean, I you know you love to dress up, but it's usually for a lecture. I wonder if you wear your bullfighting outfit uh, <laughs> when you only struggle. Only occasionally, only occasionally. <laughs> so this gives you a glimpse. And what's interesting is Goya, we can think of him as self-taught. Uh, he had a couple of um, classical teachers, but um, he didn't do really well with academy. He actually, uh, for those of you who apply for competitions or have ever been rejected from an exhibition, you and a great company because that was Goya. Goya was rejected over and over again, multiple occasions from academy, from the classical establishment and institution of art. And like everybody else at the time, he dreamed to go to Italy to better educate himself in the arts and the academy rejected to pay for his journey. So he paid it himself. And uh, biographers of his day attributed a lot of funny stories and anecdotes. So we, there's no way of telling if this is true, but this is contemporary biographers who actually said that to pay his way through for his education um, of trip, uh, the journey to Rome, that he joined a gang of bullfighters. <laughs> and, uh, but this is interesting, this a little anecdote as we do see him wearing this outfit. And more importantly, Let's just look at this stair. And you see that um, that he has his magnificent palette that we're going to return today um, in a moment. And red plays an important role. It's separated. You'll see the white glowing on his palette at the bottom. And to the left is the red. It's vermilion. That's the color that you use to tease the bull, right? And there it is separated um, and proud. You can see it displayed in the jacket as well. But as we go even... Um, to a further parallel. This is one of my favorite paintings at the uh, J. Paul Getty Museum here locally in Los Angeles. And um, it's a scene of a bullfight or what we would call in Spanish, La Tauromachia. So Tauromachia was very close um, to uh, Goya's heart, uh, particularly because it was kind of a national um, activity and identified really what it is to be Spanish and uh, in a way uh, could be used against the invasion of the foreigners so against the French who are trying to, um, to insert their own identity. So uh, you could see this bull standing on the right as opposing <laughs> and saying, I'm Spanish and you can kill me. I will remain being Spanish. Um, and Goya loved uh, the subject matter so much and he used it metaphorically and literally um, and uh, returned to it in 33 prints of the series uh, Tauromachia. But the reason I show it to you here I would like to really take a look a little bit closer. And you know, if you watch this before, and if you have, if you're joining for the first time, we want to hear from you. So please type away in the chat. We will read your comments carefully and respond. So I want to know when you look at Goya's self-portrait alongside the uh, the scene of the bullfight, uh, who is he trying to identify with? Who does he represent? The bull or the picador who is about to attack him or try to cause him his death? So while you're typing your responses, I wonder what Jeff thinks. Well, seeing it side by side with this, I've never you know, put them over the top like this. I, I, my first gut instinct is the bull, right? He, he, he's uh, seen himself in this kind of doomed but uh, adversarial uh, position. It's, it's an intriguing image, isn't it? It's so interesting. And if we identify Goya, who kind of looks a little bit, but if you look at the eye, right, particularly the stare, the yeah. way that the bull is just so stubborn. And we see the stubbornness in Goya's painting, right? But I wonder if we have any responses from our audience. None coming in yet, but I'll keep you posted. All right, all right. So um, I, in that case, I'll suggest that uh, if you look at Goya's brush and the way he's holding it, is there anything else in the painting that reminds you of it, Jeff? Well, the spear. Yes, the picador and the way that he's holding the spear, though a way to attack for life or death. This is what we see. I'd like to suggest to you that um, there is no correct answer or that he's both. He's on both sides. He is the opposition, the bull, the stubbornness, the, the life force of this animal, but he's also the attacker. What is he attacking? He is in the bullfight for life or death with his own artwork. And this is how I'd like to present this man to you, that for him, 
him, art is life or death. For him, painting is no simple matter. And he's really intense and only will get more intense. We're getting a couple of comments. Uh, the bull, um, perhaps uh, uh, the picador, but also maybe collectively the group facing the bull, uh, all of us. So some, some very... Oh. Conversations, yeah. This is brilliant. Um, thank you for um, our audience because, and it's interesting that you notice the audience, the audience in the painting. So I'm going to point it out, uh, painted rather abstractly back here. Um, I was going to include a close up, but when I closed up on it, it's only, only a bunch of brush marks. Uh, but when you back away from the painting, you can actually see some somebody's actually trying to get over the wall of the arena and get into the stage stage to participate. So um, for Goya, audience is extremely important and always thinking about you guys, always thinking about what you think. And this kind of mass, Jungian mass that has a strength of opinion for better or worse. And sometimes he'll uh, laugh at both sides. He'll laugh at himself as an artist. He'll laugh at you as an audience. And we just have to go with it, right? But this is really, really uh, impressive that you've noted that. Um, I wanted to quickly take a look at the close-up of a portrait. So here we actually see um, a, a brother of the king of Spain at the time. Um, and the reason I bring you closer to this portrait, because I want to make sure with, that we think about Goya's technique today, as well as his subject matter. And Goya's painting look the way they do, like most artists, because of the underpainting that he chooses for his image. So he will never paint on a white canvas. He will always take his canvas and add a layer of color that will give a tonality. Yes, it's a hue, it's a color, it's a kind of a vibration of color, and yet it will affect our mood and how the colors will ring on it and reverberate. You could think of it in musical terms as major or minor, you know, generally minor creating kind of a somber and sad mood and major being more uplifting. Here, the first color, the underpainting that's underneath everything else in this painting affects how we react to Goya. And I wanted you to, to look closer and see if you can detect underneath the skin, the highlights, but also in the jacket, underneath the white wrapping around his neck and even underneath the gray one color that's glowing i wonder if it's becoming apparent uh jeff if it is to you please please share it with us yeah i'm seeing some type of ochre or umber that looks like it's underneath there dark uh, yes and i hope that everyone can see this so i show you next the, clue, uh, the, the full portrait, and it is unfinished. And Goya thankfully left us a series of unfinished portraits, and we can actually see the process without even an x-ray technology. To the naked eye, you could see exactly what Jeff had said, a variation of ochres and probably burnt umbers that is mixed to create this orangey glow. So the very first color, you could see it here at the bottom, right? And all around, it's underneath everything. It informs the painting. And even as we go back for a moment, if you look at the, the bullfight scene, can you detect the same glow? And then let's go back for a moment. Can you detect the same glow underneath the self-portrait? So I want you to be on the lookout because this is what informs Goya's art and how you will perceive it. And we want to keep thinking of this nervous looking orange that's coming through everything. He's testing his other colors, the whites and the blacks. You could see at the edge of the painting, this is very common for painters to test out before you go in. That. What did you say, Jeff? It's great to see that testing. Uh, uh, I do the same thing too. You want to see how the color is going to actually interact on the surface as opposed to on your palette because it's very different, right? Exactly, exactly. And also we could see this informality, the way that he's painting. Uh, yes, this is going to be a badge of honor and this incredible decorations on his chest, but he's just, I mean, this could be, Jeff, a close-up of your abstraction, you know, this series that you've had, like the flag lo looking uh, serious, right? So yeah. it's really amazing how he borders uh, re representational art with, with abstract, ab abstract elements. 
So we keep going. And I wanted to say that Goya pretty quickly manages to become a favorite at the royal court. And uh, here we actually presented, uh, you know, if you travel to Spain today, which I hope you have, and if you haven't, let's go, uh, we would go to Prado Museum. And Prado Museum still has about 130 paintings by Goya because this was a royal collection. And he painted so many of his images for the royal family. And here we come to the first contradiction while he's celebrating the royals and everyone at the court. Let's take a look a little bit closer. Uh, please meet Maria Luisa here, the Queen of Spain, and Charles IV of Spain on the right. And now I want you to imagine this is your family portrait and you being immortalized, and this is how you're going to be remembered forever overweight <laughs> with bellies that are pushing through your clothes uh, with, um, I think the king has four chins, the queen has at least a couple, uh, beady eyes, uh, almost um, insecure looks. Oh, I don't mention her arms, right? Um, and uh, she was supposed to be a charming, seductive woman with many lovers. Um, and here we see a not so flattering image. So my question to you, would you be happy with this portrait? Well, everyone at the court was, and this is the one of the, those mysteries that we don't understand. How did this not, people did not see that Goy is actually already satirizing, laughing, and taking the opportunity to show the vanity of these people, the vanity of all of us, right? We're trying to dress up and look our best, but sometimes not to our flattering self. Um, so what was the response? So this is Goya in the letter to his friend. I tell you that I have nothing more to wish for. They were extremely pleased with my pictures and expressed great satisfaction, not only the king, but the prince as well. The reason he doesn't have anything to wish for because he gets the position of the first royal court painter. Now remember, with very little education and uh, largely self-taught, this is the position that was previously occupied a uh, generation before by the greatest of the great, Diego Velazquez, right? And so he says, I have nothing else to wish for. I, I've made it, you know, I've gotten my 10 Oscars. And he says, I have now established an enviable way of living. And if anyone wants anything from me, that means a portrait, they must come to me. <laughs> I don't go to you, you must come to me. And uh, this is what I wanted to show you, how true this statement is. So when we see the left side of that large painting, uh, uh, we see the queen and actually the future king right here standing in the blue. Um, I want you to look in the shadows past the future king back here. Who do we see, Jeff? Goya. Goya, a self-portrait. And he's standing in front of a very large canvas and out of the shadows, towering above everyone, his eye, his critical eye is taking it all in. By the way, one of my favorite characters right here. I mean, she's particularly interesting looking. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what, what I find really interesting here, and this is my question to Jeff and to our audience, is... Okay, Goya is back there, the artist for whom everyone has traveled to his own studio uh, to pose, right? So the photographer, you might say, is back there, but nobody's watching him at the court. They're all turning to the audience. They're all turning their backs to him. Why? My question is why to all of our audience, why would they turn? And if we go back for a moment and look at the large composition, uh, <laughs> look how they set up towards you and not the artist who's behind them. And in fact, if he was to look at them, all he would see is their behinds. So Jeff, if you have any ideas or if our audience has any ideas, please share it with me. Well, I, I, I got a little secret and that is uh, that uh, I've been to the Prado and there's another painting there that's incredibly famous. And you, met, you mentioned the artist's name, Velasquez. Yes. This painting, Las Minas where he has a similar setup, right? Where we see him in reflection and, and uh, uh, who we see in front of us is not the subject of his painting. So I'm guessing this is a nod towards Velasquez yes. uh, and, and that role. And that there's somebody who uh, Goya's painting here who has everybody's attention. And I'm not sure who that would be though. Very, very much so. You're always right on the spot. And do we have any guesses from our audience for this particular peculiar setup? 
Um, we have somebody here who's getting, is there a mirror in play here, which could be, right? Yes. So this is extremely interesting. So he's playing with what? He's playing with the idea of vision. He's playing with the idea of history, thinking about Velasquez Las Meninas, as you had mentioned. But I think he's also kind of making a little bit of a joke because all of these learned, great individuals do not realize the artist is behind them. Right there, that kind of uh, I think there's a little satire going on here as well. I don't have the answer. I was just honestly very, very curious of what you and our audience would think. And the answers are fantastic. So we go to Manuel Godoy, uh, not my favorite painting by Goya, but absolutely an important individual that we must mention. Look at how this man, this officer at the battlefield is reclining. I mean, people might be uh, dying. In the background, we see cannons going off and smoke, and uh, this is in the middle of the battle. But he's looking like he's just reclining after fabulous Spanish uh, tapas and meal, right? Uh, um, Emmanuel Godoy was beloved by the queen that you had earlier met. You saw her beautiful arms and her face. And uh, she loved him so much that he got a promotion almost every month throughout the years that he was at the court. And he um, was promoted so high that he became the prime minister of foreign affairs. And why I bring your attention to it? Because everything that's going to follow in Spanish history and therefore in Goya's artwork is dependent on this man because this man mismanaged foreign affairs. And one can say Napoleon took over Spain and caused lots of destruction and death which will later we'll see affected Goya tremendously because of this affair between the queen and Manuel Godoy. Manuel Godoy was a huge supporter, like everybody else at court was in love with Goya. And we thank him, though he uh, kind of destroyed the country, we thank him for one, supporting the publication of Capriccios, which was a body of print, prints that we're going to talk about in a moment by Goya, which were so controversial and without his approval would not have been published. And two, um, probably most likely believe that he commissioned the first uh, most revolutionary nude in art history, in the history of art. So let's take a look at Godoy very quickly. Uh, a little bit closer and uh, just a little gossip because I couldn't resist. Uh, this is the young prince that you saw in the large painting of the court portrait. And uh, this is his father, the king. And who does the prince look more like? Uh, <laughs> the uh, lover of the queen on the left or the king on the right? Who does he resemble more? Jeff? <laughs> I'm not touching that one. <laughs> so we leave it up to the audience, but it was speculated at court that the young children of the queen uh, were um, unofficially, uh, um, they were, the paternity was attributed to Godoy, to the prime minister. And actually, if you look at the nose and the forehead and the shape of the face, uh, he does seem to look much more like the minister than the king. So we don't know, but I just wanted to throw in some controversy. So Godoy, thank you so much for uh, the birth of this painting. He's believed to have commissioned La Macha Desnuda. So the Macha, which is a, a name for a lower class uh, Spanish woman, and Macho is the Spanish man uh, who represented the very core of Spanish, what, what it is to be Spanish. Uh, and uh, Desnuda, she's naked, she is nude. And this painting probably caused more controversy than almost any other painting in the history of art. Um, but it's really important to us as we come in closer now, I just wanted to mention uh, that Godoy commissioned this probably based um, after his mistress Pipita. And when we look at other images of her, it really looks like Pipita. And he commissioned it for his private cabinet where he kept other nude paintings. And we wish we could stand there right now because some of the best nudes, Titians, Velasquez, were right there and Goya paints to be in their company. So what's incredible, why is it so revolutionary, and uh, Goya makes many revolutionary departures, but this is one of them, is the way that this naked woman looks at the viewer. We already talked about the viewer a moment ago. She unashamed, 
we we get a little bit uncomfortable upon her uh openness and unashamed unapologetic gaze yes this is uh, this is who i am and this is what i look like take it or leave it and what's amazing about goya it's the first painting in the history of art where there's no ne if it's not a venus uh, we, we would have a nude that has negative connotations, uh, a rape, or it's a prostitute, or it's, you know, always something negative about a uh, feminine uh, body. This has no negative connotation. It's a total celebration of the woman of a female body. And this is the painting that it would have hung next to in the cabinet of Godoy. And he makes Velasquez look shy compared to Goya, right? Uh, we only see the behind. And uh, the, the Venus here looks at the mirror and only sees her face reflecting. Uh, at, at his time, in his own time, this was considered controversial, but nothing like Goya, right? You could see the difference. You could see the trajectory and where he's going with this. Now, what's really interesting, another paradox number two. Remember, I'm going to be quizzing you at the Goya paradoxes at the end, Jeff. So <laughs> paradox number one was uh, how unflattering he is and how celebrated he is uh, and gets away with it. Number two is that after he paints the Disnuda, a few years later, he paints um, this image, uh, which is exactly the same size. And this is Maha dressed. So it's kind of a reversal. It's not a strip tease. It's not taking off the clothes. It's now putting on the clothes back on. Um, and my question to our audience, why do you think he did this? Again, I don't have the answer. I'm very curious uh, what our astute audience thinks. And I'm also very curious, uh, always glad to hear from Jeff. You know, I didn't know that the order, I, I knew they were painted in similar times. And I, my guess was always one was for display and the other one was for private appreciation. Um, and so I'm going to stick with that, that this is this is going to be put somewhere where other people can see it. And the uh, the prior the nude is somewhere for his own pleasure, at least for his pleasure and maybe close friends. Yeah, very interesting. I also was reading and laughing that uh, the disnuda, um, the reason it's given the title Maha later, because Goya never titled his paintings as most artists. Uh, Maha, as I said, uh, this lower class Spaniard, uh, it's uh, titled because of her outfit. And here it's kind of funny to think about her outfit, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in this painting, it's really this painting that gives the title to the other one, right? This is the traditional Spanish outfit. Do we have any comments or questions from the audience? Nothing's coming in yet for me in the chat. So I think but they're still working on. on all right, all right. It takes a moment to type and, abs yeah. and absorb yeah. it. Uh, so um, one of the suggestions, and this is what they look like together. To this day, they're exhibited together in Prado. You could see them, enormous paintings. Um, one of the suggestions was, or one of the rumors was that they were like a playing card uh, or like a cover and one would hang in front of the other and then he would slide it and undress the previous one. Uh, so there was a, a speculation that uh, that's how it was intended later to be displayed. There were all kinds of rumors that um, that uh, he was trying to hide it. And again, like Jeff had said, for public eye, for to um, to escape the scrutiny, he would say, "Oh no, 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 she's dressed. This is an innocent painting, right?" So kind of two versions of the same image. Well after six years of its creation, it is discovered by Inquisition. And there is a huge um, kind of a, a campaign to throw Godoy out of power. And the Inquisition is used, and this painting is used to try to throw him to jail. And Godoy is being called to court, uh, uh, and he's very scared. And not only Godoy, but also He's curator. So if we have any museum curators, or if you have a curated an exhibition uh, watching today, uh, this was a dangerous position. And they say, who painted this? And how did you allow this to happen? And of course, they say Goya, <laughs> right? Trying to save their life. And then Goya is called in for one of the two trials that he's been actually uh, 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 presented against Inquisition. And he makes his famous defense. And he says, I painted this in a great tradition of Titian. And um, for those of you who watched the Titian episode, um, uh, this is the 
painting, the Venus that we talked about that he's referring to. If you haven't watched, please watch our previous uh, Titian episode. Um, it was the nudes uh, in art. I highly recommend it. And so the Inquisition says, oh, Titian. Well, Titian was accepted by the great Spanish king, Philip IV. And they say, well, if it's in Titian tradition, we forgive you. And he gets away. Uh, but the painting was confiscated at the time. And uh, Goya has a very uneasy uh, relationship with Inquisition. He hates it as an institution and he mocks it over and over again. So this is a tribunal, uh, uh, the trial that he paints and you could see the mocking of the institution, how the people are, uh, the accused are having to wear ridiculous cloaks and hats. Um, and these particular hats, you might recognize them are a kind of a mockery um, of a traditional religious garment worn in the Catholic processions uh, for the people who are um, interested in penitence and showing their own sins. They voluntarily put it on, but here it's reversed and put on as a mock, as a kind of a mockery of the uh, accused. Um, and this chilling painting, you could see it a little bit closer. Um, what are they guilty for? We're not really sure. And the crowd is ready to devour them. And imagine Goya sitting in the similar shoes and um, having to deal with this. So Goya says, but now, well, now, now I have no fear of witches, goblin, goss, ghosts, thugs, giants, ghouls, skellywags. In his letter to his best friend, he writes, I'm not scared. And what he's referring to, I've seen the humanity and what they do. I'm scared of human beings, not the witches, not the supernatural. I'm scared of what we call the natural, what we do to each other. And here's Goya's contradiction number three. So he says, I'm not scared. I'm not fearful of witches and the goblins. And we uh, present it with a painting that gives me chills. I was even afraid to look at it. I sent it to my mother in a text and she screamed when she received it. Uh, witches flight, well, one of the scariest paintings I think has ever been painted. So Goy's contradiction, he says he's not scared but he's painting something that makes me scared, makes us scared. Um, and something that perhaps shouldn't even be looked at. Why do I say that? Um, take a look what's happening here. Can you tell Jeff what, what is going on in the scene? Well, it looks like, you know, they're hovering in the air and they have this man and they're, they're uh, devouring him, drinking his blood, something like that. Yes, and my mom being a, a, a doctor all of a sudden said, they're sucking at his liver. I mean, she was giving me all these gory details, right? So it's really disturbing. And all that levitation, uh, total, I mean, if you ever wanted to paint levitation, this is the most convincing scene, the lack of gravity. And the gravity he's, is emphasized, but the, the people and the animal on the ground, the ground is really emphasized and how they're defying this and having their feast up in the air. By the way, wearing what's on their heads? Oh, the same hats from the same hats, right? I really wanted you to notice that. And the reason I say it shouldn't be looked at uh, look at the people on the ground, they're all averting their gazes. Uh, you could see the man had fallen with his face down, he's covering his ears so he wouldn't hear. Imagine the, the uh, howling and the cackling and the laughing of these witches. And the other man who's covered his head, trying to run away, and while he runs away, has a veil above him. Him. In a traditional religious setting, we have in a temple, in a church, we have a veil that's hung between the altar because it's so sacred. It's called the sacred veil, right? Uh, <clears throat> that you don't look behind it because God might be present there. Uh, here you have a kind of an evil veil. Behind this veil, you shouldn't look because evil dwells. And even the animal to the right is trying to avert his gaze. Um, so we have this uh, horrific image, but what I think he's really trying to show you here, as you notice the, the dancers had the, the same um, hats of inquisition, that perhaps it's not so much supernatural, perhaps that he, this is a parallel to the trial and these men who are 
eating the other vit witnesses, the other human beings alive, taking their lives, making fun of them, publicly humiliating, that these witches represent the trials of inquisition. So when he says, I'm not afraid of witches, and yet we see the witches seen, perhaps this is much more of a political nature. I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's uh, exactly what we're seeing. And, and I think uh, the idea of people shielding their eyes or not looking at it directly, you know, kind of it, it exists. Uh, they know it exists, but they are in some kind of denial or, or uh, yes, they allow it to happen. What a wonderful comment. I agree with you, right? It happens right in front of our eyes, but we must avert our gazes from fear, right? right. Um, that's happening today so much uh, in our world as well. All of this is so modern. You could see why he's called the first modern painter. Now, uh, I wanted to show you exactly a perfect link how um, our own inquisition, our own uh, censorship lives in our hearts today. So this is a stamp that was made as a series uh, celebrating 100 years since the death of Goya. It was issued by Span Span Spain and it caused international controversy because all these letters went out with the naked uh, Maha. And this was that, believe it or not, this was the first nude stamp in the history of stamps. And it caused such an uproar. Okay. <laughs> Zenia, could you hold yes. for just one minute? Yes. I just got a message from folks uh, on the technical side. I think there may be some issue with the feed. Uh, so if folks could just bear with me for a second. Oh, it looks like it's coming through on our Facebook page. So um, we'll see. Uh, I'm going to check Facebook. So hold with me one. Sure, 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 oh, sure. Yeah, I want to make sure uh, um, if we've got a recent... Uh, um, comment here i see the postage stamp i think i see me talking in the corner so that looks good can maybe anybody who's watching just make a quick comment in the facebook uh, feed that uh, you're catching this live or if you're having problems seeing it and then i'll know whether we need to proceed or, or link back up again gonna give folks a chance to jump on there maybe i'll make a comment here Test. All right, it looks like it's working. I'm going to go ahead and resume uh, uh, with these. And you so go ahead, Jenya, and, and let's keep going. It looks like we're in. The test just came up. The image looks okay. Uh, go it's ahead, right. and, and I'll right. turn it over back to you. Just wanted to make sure folks were still seeing us. So go for it. Great. So this stamp cost uh, made it all the way to America, of course, with the letters. And uh, um, it was so controversial that the Times magazines had said an indecent picture is bad enough. <laughs> Talking about Goya, but a postage stamp whose backside must be licked. Millions of innocent children collect stamps. So I thought it was really funny how um, in our own day, we have our own hangs, hang ups when it comes to a uh, female body and our own censorship, our own inquisition, right? The, in the public eye. And so um, the Spanish uh, refused to take her off the market and she's out there still, watch out. So talking about women and passion and women's body, uh, there was a woman that really uh, was considered one of the most beautiful women of the time, and she became a friend of Goya's, and many had speculated that they had um, an affair, but it, whether or not they did, uh, what, it, uh, what it created is a series of most amazing uh, portraits of uh, a woman that lives for eternity, and uh, this woman was the Duchess of Alba, and uh, she was uh, described uh, by a French visitor that every hair on her head elicits desire. And this particular um, uh, drawing and ink wash on paper um, shows off how she's rushing her hair through her cascading hair. And I watched one of the great uh, documentaries about Goya um, and the man who was talking, he said, if, if an actress could play this woman today in a Goya's film, it should be the young Cher. Um, and I say that because it's such a striking likeness if you think of Cher and her black uh, cascading hair. And I want this woman to come alive to you. And Goya 
becomes really great friend of hers. He is, she's about 35. He is um, already 52 years old man, 20 years her senior. And he creates this very famous portrait. This is one of the most famous portraits by Goya the, of the Duchess of Alba. And the black, it's called the Black Portrait of Duchess of Alba because she is in mourning this phenomenal outfit. Uh, she has just become widowed and she has become the richest woman in Spain. And she is in her estate. You could see her standing at her property. And she invites Goya to come live with her for a few uh, weeks, I think. And uh, there he paints a series of ama amazing images. And notice that she's pointing, you know, she looks so proud and she's pointing down to the earth that she's standing on, right? So we follow her finger. And when you follow her finger to her feet, there's something that's scratched in the earth. And can you see what it is, uh, Jeff? Um, it is Goya's name. I don't know the translation for the first part of it, but it's something Goya. Perfect. You just did a perfect comment. So it is Goya. And we chatted with you offline uh, right before the show started today that Goya loves to hide his name throughout his paintings. That's one, one of my favorite aspects about him. Um, this is in the tradition of Rembrandt. Rembrandt loves to hide his name and let you discover. Here it's scratched through in the sand Goya. And um, right before it, it says solo, solo Goya only Goya. So my question to our audience and my question to Jeff is, what does he imply by that? Solo Goya, only Goya. So we're experiencing some technical issues getting questions transferred to Facebook to me on Zoom. So I'm going to try to look at both at the same time. Uh, oh, you could be our you could be our yeah, audience. So you I'm could going to try to go back and yeah. forth and see what other folks are asking. Only Goya, you know this is, is this is a one of the mysteries of art history, right? Did they have a relationship beyond uh, friendship? Uh, and uh, this would certainly infer that that was the case, but this is Goya making the painting, not her. So is this one-sided relationship? I don't know. It's, it's yes. kind of really a interesting. And as a painter, not as an art historian, I think he's saying, now this is just me saying, this is Genia, this is not official opinion. Only Goya could have made this. <laughs> <laughs> Only Goya could have seen her this way. Only Goya could have made this beautiful painting, this amazing image. So the Goya. But to go with what and say against me and for Jeff, uh, when we go a bit closer and we follow that hand and we look at her rings on her his uh, in the in her index finger she wears Goya, and on her middle finger she uh, wears her own name, Alba. So here he kind of uh, uh, married them, right? He married the sitter and the painter. Again, it could be that um, he's talking about not necessarily a relationship, but a kind of a relationship between the collector, right? Because the collector and the artist, uh, the person who commissions the work can often be a collaborator. So you could look at it as a technical aspect or you can look at it as an affair or his wishful thinking, but really interesting moreover how from far it looks an official portrait but as we get closer and closer, he inserts himself into the work. Now, Los Caprichos, the caprices that he creates, um, is probably one of the most important and famous series of um, etchings. And um, he created about 80, 80 of them. And what caprichos really means, so you know it from the English word caprices, basically a whim. And that's very important for us to think about it. Why would an artist make whims? But what he's trying to say, in my opinion, is that he's not painting official subject matter. He's not painting prescribed subject matter that's been addressed by other artists. He's going by the whim of the artist. He's creating this new vision that has never been shown before. And these are really satirical images. Now, you have to remember that he is an artist to three consecu consecutive 
kings of Spain. And yet these are really attacking the royal establishment and all of the institutions underneath. So keep this in mind. And it begins with um, self-portrait when we open the series of Caprichos. Um, by the way, uh, you can buy you can buy them today. You can see them uh, the whole series online for free. But they're beautiful books. Um, that thanks to Jeff, I'm holding one of these um, a Capricci series that you could get and as a collector for your own home. You could also buy uh, one of these prints today on uh, as well and own it. But it begins with a self-portrait, and uh, the the reason that it's here is to introduce you Goya again, reintroduce him in a very different light. Uh, by this time, he had suffered a debilitating disease that left a permanent physical disability. He became completely deaf. He lost hearing when he was 46, which is really young. And remember, he lives to 82. So for about 40 remaining years of his life, he is deaf to the outside world. When he's around his uh, Duchess of Alba, he cannot hear her. He can only see her, which actually adds uh, to how we think about the portrait, right? A different kind of sensitivity. And he's wearing his gentleman's incredible hat uh, that Jeff is wearing today. That is an homage to Goya. So he introduces oh, yeah. the whims or the caprichos with a self-portrait to say, this is coming from me, right? Uh, there is his amazing eye. Even in profile, he's looking and observing. Um, I wanted to share with you what the prints would look like. They are made on a metal plate. And so all of the, what it looks like drawings, but they're really prints. And Goya makes these exquisite plates and combines two. Uh, this is from the National Engraving Center in Madrid. They own his plates, a series of his plates. And uh, what he does, he, um, he uses both etching and acid uh, where you put the plate into, submerge it into the acid and where you scratch through, um, the, through the protective varnish, the acid etches for you and create very thin lines, beautiful lines. He also uses engraving where you take a very sharp needle and actually literally make the grooves in the plate. And he uses aquatint, which is a much more modern technique available to him at the time when you create a, a kind of a braised surface of the plate and and it gives you washes. It makes it look like darkness, series of value gradations from light to dark. And it really contrasts sharply with the etching lines. Wherever you see the silver shine, that's the plate, the metal that hasn't been touched. To us, it looks black. So these images like below the horse or in the background that looks black, that will come out looking white when you make the print because that's where the ink will slide off and will not reside. For everything that looks white, that will be black. So you have to have a reverse thinking. And also, of course, the etching is reverse because when you print it and pull off the paper, you get a mirror image. And that's how this series that I'm about to share with you is created. I really wanted to share, even if it's breezing through, uh, through this process. Did you want to add anything, Jeff? This is an amazing process. I mean, the, you have drafting skills, which his are phenomenal, right? But then to be able to do it on a plate is just a whole other level. I mean, it's, you know, the only other person I can think of that uh, is at this level is Rembrandt and his drafting and etching skills, right? Correct. Uh, although Aquitin is not um, invented yet during Rembrandt uh, time. So Rembrandt makes it up by uh, scratching through the plate. And here I wanted to go back and show you. So the shiny part, that's the white of the paper. Uh, the silverly lines, that's the black marks. And the aquatint that we add to Rembrandt's technique is in the background where you see a series of dotted gray background and mm -hmm. in his jacket. So a very, even more complicated than I would process. dare to yeah. say process. Uh, it really is amazing. And uh, I wanted to introduce another quote by Goya um, in thinking about these caprichos, this series. The world is a masquerade. Look, dress, and voice. Everything is only pretension. Everyone wants to appear to be what he's not. Everyone is deceiving, and no one ever knows himself. 
It's an amazing quote because he not only says we pretend to be something we wish to be, but we're not. But through this series of masquerade of pretending, of trying to be the best citizen, of trying to be the wealthiest, the most educated, the best artist, whatever you might want, the mask you want to uh, wear, we forget who we were because we've been pretending so long. And that is what he wants to do. He wants to unmask and show what's underneath of this world of masquerade. So I present to you this, and he puts this wonderful titles that are engraved. Uh, here, the, wor the work is titled by Goya. Um, you might think of them as titles or ac accompanying phrases that illuminate the subject matter. So this one is called, and so was his grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> we look a little bit closer. Uh, this is a donkey looking at a book he's studying. And in the book, you can see everybody important was also a donkey. And as we fill this phrase, and so was his grandfather, I ask you dot, 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 was what? And the word, the correct name is an ass, right? So uh, he's asking the audience to fill in for him and say, you know, this aristocrat who is putting the pictures of himself in the book and to say, I come from a great lineage is an ass, right? Literally. And here's another one. He's really attacking the modern education um, under the system. Uh, pretty teacher, Linda Maestra, uh, the pretty teacher um, is sitting in the front on the broom. Here she is. And this is uh, in a way that we say the not joke, right? Pretty teacher, not. <laughs> this is really sarcastic. She's this old cackling witch. And what she's doing, she's taking the young and leading them astray, right? So the elderly pretending to be wise, uh, taking the young and leading them astray through the education. Here's another one, the rise and fall, subir Ebayar. So here, if you notice, um, the man who's being raised to be celebrated in power, he's actually uh, supported by the satire. And the satire is sitting upon, let's see if I have a little, um, I'll, I'll show you in a moment. He's sitting upon the man's bodies. He's sitting on other men who are supporting him, supporting this elevation of, to victory by the fall of others. And all of this is on a huge globe. It's like saying, I own the world, but at the expense of the others, the fallen others. This kind of victory is temporary because if you are standing upon the bodies of others, you too will fall. So it's showing you a cycle, right? The falling and the rising. And who this man is, we recognize this is Godoy. And Godoy will fall out of power the same way that he was raised to it once Napoleon comes in um, and occupies Spain. So this is a direct satire. And here's a close up of uh, the satire holding up the legs and sitting on the bodies of others to support it. Jeff, if you have any comments at any point, just jump in. Um, I'm still kind of watching the feed. They're still uh, trying to get the connection for questions. It is broadcasting so people can see it. Wonderful. So okay. we have Los Chinchillas, which is one of my favorite prints. The title Chinchillas is coming from a modern play that was very popular about a family that is so, it was a comedy, a family that's so occupied with their aristocratic uh, family lineage uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, they're Los Chinchillas, that they're obsessed with finding who they are and how gra grand they are. And here Los Chinchillas are shown uh, with padlocks on their ears and they are spoon fed the knowledge by blinded donkey men, the men with donkey ears. So really a diluted and a diverted uh, self aggrandizing and they're wearing their Family crest it really looks like a straight jackets from insane asylum, right? So their aristocracy and their self aggrandizing is holding them back, is turning them to imbeciles. But what's really interesting about it, it might look familiar to you, that bottom character. Compare it. Uh, do you recognize Jeff who is on the left? Oh, yes, it's Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein. So uh, it was, uh, yes, he was based upon Las Chinchillas de Goya. Can you recognize now the eyes and the mouth and even the screw going through the neck, a kind of a similar similarity here. So we have this in our mass culture. You might have been aware of this print just through Frankenstein. I, I found that really interesting. 
Okay, so this is a, an iconic image, uh, the sleep of reason, um, where we think that it could be even showing the artist who had fallen asleep, and it says, uh, El sueño de la razón produce monstruosos, the sleep of reason produces monsters. And all these strange, levitating, menacing characters are um, seem to be uh, not only in the background, but really um, rising from the head of the artist, from the imagination of the artist. Get a little bit closer to you. And the quote uh, by Goya, he says, imagination, if not restrained by reason, brings forth monsters, but combined with reason is the mother of the arts and the source of wonders. And here we have I think third or fourth paradox of Goya, because he wants to create the great art, but he's struggling with the reason of accepting the monstrosity that he sees in the world. And that takes us to the most important series, the disasters of war, Los Disasters de la Guerra. The disasters of war were also a series of etchings, about 80 of them, uh, but unlike Los Caprichos, they were not published until about 30 years after uh, Goya's death. So he himself never saw it printed like we get a chance to see them printed, um, but he worked on the plates. And these are the most unbelievable images showing what the men do to, to themselves. So this one, we return to this idea, one cannot look at this, no se puede mirar. Um, and uh, it's really important. We, we talked about this covering the face or averting the gaze, but here are the victims of this brutality uh, a woman, a child, a mother, a child, her child is about to be murdered uh, by the warriors um, in front of her. Men pleading. Nobody in the sprint is able to open their eyes. Can we look at it? We're opening our eyes. We're looking at it. Should we not close our eyes? Should we avert a gaze or should we face this and do something about it? Where are the murderers? Uh, Jeff, take a look at this and find the warriors for me. Well, I see the bayonets fixed, pointing at them. Yes, always sharp. You're always great, Jeff. They are there implied. So these are not the French. This is not the whoever you want to put, uh, whoever is opposing your country or your time period. For Goya, there would have been the French, right, invading. But it is that, that evil force, the, the warrior that is going to kill the innocent. And here, when you see the large print, he excluded them from the print, only the weapon, the senseless, brutal weapon that is attacking. I think it's really a brilliant statement to take his own time out of this and say, Say this is as long as one man attacks the other. This is brutality that I can barely look at. And this takes us to his most famous uh, painting, uh, probably the most famous painting in the world, El Tres de Mayo, or the 3rd of May. And this really shows us the moment, uh, uh, the mis miscalculation by the French and the Spanish. So we have a very interesting series of events and the reason that I uh, included Godoy in this presentation. Remember, Godoy was the prime minister of foreign affairs and he was proposed by Napoleon that if he joins Napoleonic army, if he unites with um, France, that against Portugal, that they'll divide Portugal and give a third of Portugal to Godoy. And Godoy was so greedy and he didn't see through Napoleon's deceit and said, that sounds great. Me, nobody who just raised through the favors of the queen gets a third of a country. And he uh, invites the friends to come in and about 23,000 troops of so French soldiers uh, upon a great celebration are invited to, France, they, uh, to, to Spain. They enter Spain uh, uh, with Spanish willingly accepting them, only to realize they're entering there to take over the Spain and Napoleon to rule now and impose his own brother as the next uh, uh, ruler of Spain. So when the, uh, I say it's miscalculation by the French and the Spanish, so the Spanish through Godoy miscalculate, the uh, Napoleon miscalculates the Spanish. Um, 
because he is great Admiral Marshal Murat says, the population of Madrid led astray has given itself to revolt and murder. French blood has flowed. It demands vengeance. All those arrested in the uprising, arms in hand will be shot. So what happened, there was a revolt where on the 2nd of May, which is also a painting Goya makes, it's kind of like a series, uh, the Spanish once realized it wasn't the Spanish army, it was the Spanish people was considered the first guerrilla war uprised against the French. And of course they were arrested very quickly. And on the next day, like Murat says here, they will all be killed. And um, in various places around the city, around Madrid and Spain, um, they're all shot and destroyed in the eyes of all of the other civilians. These are innocent civilians, often not even the ones who were not praising, grabbed and uh, it's a show. It's a show to show the French uh, a power. And Goya, who was actually very split because originally he was supporting the French invasion because he was opposing um, the deterioration of the Spanish court. He was very interested in the French Enlightenment, uh, the thought of great new education. He did not expect this violence. And so uh, he's again, another contradiction, contradiction of Goya. He was supporting the French and now he sees the brutality. He doesn't know whose side to support. He just sees the violence and creates this incredible painting. It is departing from all traditions. There's no such painting in the history of art where a brutal act, a human act is shown of simple murder. No such painting exists unless it's a religious image. So it's really, really important um, in the kind of a political historical um, uh, way. And as we get closer, we just see also how it's painted. Uh, many at the time had criticized it and said it was too loose and uh, the space is uh, compressed. It doesn't look, look realistic. But what Goya does, he paints it so immediate, so in a way simple. Uh, the blood that you see at the bottom spilling is just paint, but that makes it even more grotesque and more painful. Uh, and uh, this type of image, the only thing that you could really uh, compare it to would be to previously, as I mentioned, religious imagery. This is by Peter Paul Rubens, for instance, an enormous altarpiece of the raising of the cross. And when we get a little bit closer, we see Christ uh, being ra raised on the cross, his arms, notice the arms, the ways the arms are spre spread uh, the same way in the hero of the 3rd of May and uh, a kind of defiant gaze. But there are many, many asimilarities. First of all, our hero, our modern Christ, if you will say, is not looking up to God. He's no looking upwards to say, I will be, you know, I'll be, there's a point to this madness. There's a point to the human br brutality. Uh, perhaps there's going to be salvation through my sacrifice. No, there's no such thing. He's looking directly into the eyes of the mass of the executioners. He is looking at the death itself and there is no salvation. There's no point to this. And the second thing that's really important, uh, there's not one hero that's being crucified. There's a chain of accused and this is anonymous suffering this is not great hero of christianity this is an anonymous man who will be replaced by other anonymous men dying for nothing right so the heroism is taken away and shown just really kind of t shown inside out and yet he's uh saying take me i stand for my country so there's interesting parallels and contradictions here Jeff, any any comments, questions here? Well, from my from my own perspective, I remember as a young painter, this to me was one of the most powerful paintings I had seen. It and and this to me is that hinge you mentioned earlier for Goya, right? Where we move to something that is truly contemporary. This kind of subject matter is like uh, contemporary war correspondence. It's it's like we're witnessing yes. the atrocity. And and you're right. There's no allegory or metaphor here. It's it's the the uh, you know just the horror of of what's taking place. And the, I, it's the same as that print you just showed, right? The uh, the uh, yes, the bayonets. Perpetrators are anonymous. We don't see the faces of the soldiers committing the crime. We just see their guns pointed. And and uh, I think that's very telling as well. 
Yes, so that you could see the uh, how his printmaking and his thinking out loud informs his painting. And as I mentioned, this was supposed to be a series, um, about four paintings in the series, and two are lost that they're only described uh, by a contemporary visitor. Um, and it probably shows because it was so out of the box and both not just subject matter, but also how it's painted, uh, that it probably showed distaste towards him uh, rather than celebrating what we think of a modern icon. Um, I did want to show that in the hand of our hero, uh, there seems to be a stigmata, just like on the hand of Christ. This is a detail from Rubens as well. Um, so it is this play on modern here, modern suffering taken outside of religion, right? So both looking at religious imagery and standing outside of it. And that takes us to Black Goya, the darkest Goya, the paintings that we must not avert our eyes from, but very difficult to look at. And they're painted in the Quinta del Sordo, which is the house of the deaf is very interesting because after all of this brutality, uh, Goya goes out of Madrid and rents, or I'm not sure if he buys or rents, uh, moves to a house uh, uh, in a small village outside of Madrid that had a nickname. It's not because Goya is deaf. It had a nickname, the House of the Deaf, where uh, a famous a peasant uh, lived and probably it was like a hunted house, right? And that's where he moves away from all of this atrocity. This is where I wanted to mention before we go to Black Goya, that Black itself, it's not just a metaphor for the dark darkness of the subject matter or the atrocities of war, or human suffering, but it's actually pointing back to Goya's technique. And we know that he loved Black so much that he had displayed in his self-portrait four different types of Black on his palette. And um, I want to, uh, for a moment, jump to uh, Jeff to tell us about the Black in Goya's paintings. So there were three Blacks that are mentioned on his palette, right? You had, uh, and, and before I get into this too, for everyone, we're going to post a link into the comments that's going to go directly to Blick, and we have the whole palette represented of the Rembrandt paints, Goya's palette. So if you're interested in, in looking at some of these colors more closely, uh, they're available there. But uh, we talked about this before the uh, before the presentation today, and, and uh, the uh, blacks that are mentioned are ivory black. Uh, of course, in Goya's time, it was actually ivory, uh, the tusks of elephants, but today we no longer use that. We use a combination typically of a bone black uh, mixed with blue often, uh, and that bone black is an animal uh, byproduct for folks who are interested uh, in knowing the origins of the pigments. Another black that's mentioned is lamp black. Uh, of course, in Goya's time, that was literally the soot gathered from burning lamps. Today, uh, it's a, a more involved process, but essentially the same thing. It's either petroleum or natural gas that's uh, burned to create this carbon uh, that's used in the making of the black. And then there's another black that's mentioned that there's kind of a question mark. There's peach black. Now, I'm I, my understanding is peach black at the time of Goya was literally uh, charred peach pits or the stones from a peach, right, that were burnt and an organic compound. There's another black that's very similar. It's called vine black uh, that was used, other organic matter that was charred and, and uh, crushed into the pigment. Um, today, a comparable color for peach black uh, or vine black would be oxide black or Mars black that, that uh, are available and are shared with us. So those are just a couple examples. Uh, again, the pigments that we have today are synthesized from inorganic or organic materials. So they're not exactly the same type of pigments that uh, Goya was, was using at that time. Uh, some like ivory back for obvious reasons, right? Um, but uh, it is very interesting to kind of take a dive into how artists made their colors and then and what are the modern or contemporary versions of those colors. So my recommendation to you, thank you, Jeff, for that really illuminating to me, because I think about a palette with black or without black, right? Impressionists <laughs> illuminate the, eliminate the black and go bright on us, and traditional artists use the black. But it's so much more complex, as Jeff had described. And the reason being really because all these different blacks, and I highly recommend you experiment. And again, we're putting in the link for you if you'd like, um, so you can purchase and experiment with this. Um, 
that they have different warmth. Some are cooler, some are warm. And if you add a little bit of white or a little bit of yellow ochre, your black will go green, blue, brown, or reddish. And so you don't even need other colors. Just mixing black into your skin tones will create different shadows and subtlety. In addition, they have different translucency and drying speed. So some will dry faster or slower, matte or more shiny. And also some will be not so dense. So you'll be able to see through the pores as you mix sort of the pores of the canvas, the pore of the skin, and some will be more dense and opaque, creating dense backgrounds. So just for fun, uh, whether you're painting abstract or uh, still life or portrait, I really encourage you to create a palette which has white uh, ochres, browns, blacks, and maybe some red and see what can happen with from this limited palette. And that's what we're about to experience. So here is uh, uh, when Goya enters his dark period. Um, he is also once again gravely ill and uh, around him is his doctor, Dr. Arieta, who nurses him to health. So here we see basically Goya dying. He has lost all his color out of his face. And the doctor is like a guardian angel, bringing the uh, concoction, the mystery concoction here, the medicine to help, help um, uh, to bring him back to his health. And when he succeeds, Goya creates this painting. And this is really interesting. So first of all, take a look at this amazing, loving image um, of the guardian angel and the artist. And also, once again, as you mentioned earlier, our um, listeners mentioned the audience. There is this uh, creepy characters in the background that are witnessing everything, right? Whether they're in Goya's imagination or the others witnessing, we're not really sure. And we get a little bit closer. Uh, an amazing detail, only a person who's gone through a grave illness can identify with this, uh, where you pull the sheets, this, the way that the hands pull the sheets, almost like trying to hold on to the last breath of his life to be here. And at the bottom, what I wanted to alert you that there is a text, right? We see it here, a text at the bottom. And it seems to be like on a separate board, but this is an illusion. Uh, Goya writes an inscription in a tradition of ex voto paintings. What are ex voto paintings? This is very prominent in Spain and today even in Mexico. Uh, when you um, come very close with death experience, with a calamity, uh, it could be natural disaster, it could be losing of your loved ones, and you survive it, you make an offering, a religious offering, where you give away something as a vow um, of thanking uh, the intervention, divine intervention, and you're giving a vow to be kind or better through this vow. And this is how it looks like. Usually there's an inscription naming the savior, uh, whether it's a saint, God, or an actual person, and um, putting in the date. And that's what we see here. Goya writes, Goya in gratitude to his friend Arieta for the compassion and care with which he saved his life during the acute and dangerous illness he suffered towards the end of the year 1819 in his 73rd year. He painted it in 1820. So this interesting documentary insertion, and he gives this painting as a vow, as a gift, just like you would give it to the church. He gives it to the doctor. So I find it, again, really interesting how he plays in the tradition and religion and making it secular, making it a secular gift to say, you are my saint, you saved me. And indeed, uh, he's gifted many more years. Remember, uh, he says here in uh, uh, Save His Life, um, in his 73rd year, he lives to 82, almost another decade, thanks to the doctor, and makes the most striking, penetrating image images we're about to see. So this is painted in the, in the uh, House of the Deaf. There, these images, this series of about 13 paintings are not meant to be displayed like they are today in Madrid, in Prado, as paintings. They were murals. Goya paints them directly on the walls of his house. So eventually when the house was about to be destroyed, um, they were scraped off. So this is oil on 
directly on the plaster of the walls. Uh, they're not traditional frescoes, so they would have fallen off eventually, but they are stripped away with a layer of plaster and transferred onto canvas and then turned into this huge paintings, canvases, that are then now displayed and conserved, uh, thank God, by that they were conserved, preserved by Prada Museum. That's where you get to see them. But I want you to kind of mentally place yourself inside this haunted house with the deaf man who uh, suffered a horrible disease, another bout of a horrible disease. And this is what he paints. Saturna devorando a su hijo. So Saturn devouring his child. An image that is probably the scariest when we think about the brutality of war. This is nothing. If the parents, the family, the father himself can devour their own child, that is the ultimate uh, desecration of humanity. That is as low as we can stoop. And this horrifying image where we see, but what's really another paradox of Goya, Saturn himself, who is devouring his child, this image that is hard to project and look at, looks terrified. That's what's the paradox here. He looks like he doesn't want to, or he's like choking on this uh, 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 lunch. By the way, to give uh, another dimension to this painting, it was painted in Goya's dining room. So every time he ate his meal, uh, you would have to watch this painting. But what I want to show you that like the witches, remember he says, I'm not scared of the ghouls and the witches. Like the witches, there's another metaphor here. This is not really what it seems to be. If you think about who Saturn was, that's a Roman uh, god. Um, he was based after a Greek character, a Greek god, Cronus. And Cronus, remember Jeff, he's the god of time. So if you think here as time devouring its children, no matter if you're a king or Goya at the court with his greatest success, remember I have nothing left to wish for, I have everything, or Godoy, or uh, the greatest, most beautiful Duchess of Alba who died out from tuberculosis very young uh, and Goya outlived her for many decades. Time will devour you. We are up against time. So what do you have to do as an artist? You have to keep on creating and telling the truth before time gets you. We're in a battle with time. And uh, if you remember the story of uh, uh, Saturn, uh, Zeus did manage to outsmart time. He put, uh, Zeus was his child and he was about to be eaten, but he puts rocks into the bag and gives it to the hungry father who's, the reason he's eating his children is because he was prophesied that one of them would cause him his doom. So he's trying to struggle with his prophecy, um, uh, making them this horrific act. And instead of Zeus, he eats this bag of stone, chokes and basically dies. So Zeus is victorious of time, of his father, and perhaps we could say Goya is victorious of time because we still look at his paintings and we're talking about them today. By the way, this idea of uh, time devouring children, in his own life, Goya was married and his wife, his poor wife was pregnant and given birth 20 times and only one of his children lived to adulthood. So. I think he's also thinking about time or, or disease, devouring, taking away, away his children. And uh, it, this, is, this is the painting that's so layered. We see other gathering of witches and here, basically a scene at the court. But instead of the king, we have devil himself presiding over his congregation or his court. So take a look a little bit closer. Um, the courtiers here, we go back to the scene at the court. Um, it's replaced by this image of uh, stripping away the jewels and seeing this new system of terror that's uh, running through the streets of Spain. Another image that is one of my favorites, the two old men. And you see one of the men is leaning on the cane and another, not whispering, I would say screaming into his ear. And here we can think of the 
Goya himself, who is deaf and cannot see here for 40 years anything from the outside world. And yet he had a very loud uh, tinnitus, uh, loud noises ringing in his ears for 40 years. Imagine that nothing from the outside, only receiving this loud, disturbing noises from the inside. And it's almost like they're given birth to these characters, these screaming characters into his brain within his head. We cannot see them. We see them through the painting, but Goya lives them in his head. And we come towards the end with the image of this most mysterious image. Jeff said that's one of his favorite paintings of all times, right, Jeff? It is. I love this painting. I mean, it is uh, incredible in person as well. I love the abstract quality of it. I mean, if you put your thumb in front of the dog and you just look at this wonderful color, this these veils of color that he that he creates, but uh, uh, looking at it with the subject, it's just uh, it's filled with so much emotion. And for all of you dog lovers out there, this is towards the end of his life. He paints a portrait, not of a king or queen or witch or whoever, but of a portrait of a dog and really is a portrait um, in the middle of nowhere with, like Jeff said, that incredible background. You have to see it in person, the way that it's layered and that light um, is truly remarkable. Get you a little bit closer. Um, what is that dog? There's so much speculation. Why did he paint it? Is it almost like a self-portrait howling, right? That last howl that we hear. Um, I wanted to uh, direct your attention to an earlier portrait of Charles IV as the King of Spain. And here, Goya inserts himself. Remember I mentioned he puts his signatures in different parts of the painting. Uh, in this place, can you see where he signed himself? I do. He's on the dog collar, isn't he? Right. He's saying, I'm the king's dog. I mean, of course, he's mocking this. So he's wearing this collar. So we do have this identification of Goya as a dog, right? Uh, which is really interesting when we place these two together. Uh, you see some similarity, although this dog wears no color. It belongs to nobody. It's basically a stray. And who is it looking at? No longer its boss, no longer its owner or a bigger owner outside of this painting, right? It's like howling at God. It's like looking at, uh, uh, you know, what, what is going on with the world? What is happening to me? Why, right? Really looking outside of the painting. And as he's turning really old, he goes to voluntarily exile. He loves Spain so much, but he's forced to abandon it after all of the brutality that he's seen, after all of the uh, criticism that he given to the court by his prince, it is no longer safe for him to be around in Spain, and he exiles, self-exiles to France. He goes to Bordeaux, and in his sketchbook in Bordeaux, he uh, creates the most uh, amazing imagery, and this is one of my favorite. Uh, can you tell, Jeff, what, what it shows us? Well, it looks like an old man who's hobbling along with his walking sticks, gingerly covering the ground there. Yes, and at the very top, it has another one of Goya's sayings, and it says, Aún aprendo. And aún aprendo means I am still learning. So there's this incredible feeling. He is, uh, we know from the contemporary accounts that he himself was struggling to walk after his disease and had to relearn like a child to walk. He, is, he can barely see and hear. And he says, I'm still learning, right? It gives me chills to share this with you. And here he comes to the very end of our talk and he turns in to the other side and he looks at uh, through this, um, this is also from the Disasters of War series, uh, but he looks at um, the dead and asking the question, what happens in the afterlife? This is a great question throughout history, right? Uh, throughout religion and, and, and uh, uh, philosophy. What is after our life? Is there life after our life? And there is a corpse that's came out out of the grave to tell us uh, what, and he has a message. Can you see there's a message there? Um, and as we get closer, there is the message. Can you read it, uh, Jeff? Does it make sense? I can't read it. Well, nada, nada. Nada, which means? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. There's nothing there. <laughs> and while you might find this depressing, that's actually Goya telling you, do it now. 
whatever you need to say or paint or share or the change you want to make, do it now, right? Because not the afterwards. <laughs> so very interesting. Now, Goya is actually exhumed. He's buried in France, but then later exhumed uh, by this uh, uh, national drive of Spain to bring his hero back and be buried in Madrid. And this is really interesting. Uh, <clears throat> when they exhume him, his head was missing. It's like the ghouls and the monsters out of his painting stole his head. And the Spanish council sent a telegram saying, send Goya with or without the head. Uh, find it really gory, but very appropriate for his subject matter. It's like uh, the, the paintings themselves become real. And he is sent back to Spain where he is buried today. And towards the end of our tour, I wanted to conclude with Goya's own words. This is a magnificent, a detail of a magnificent self-portrait. And look at how he's saying, I'm still here, though there's not a afterwards. Uh, if you paint, if you tell the truth, you're still here. And he really, this is a quote I wanted to share in conclusion, which really gives a new meaning to what painting can do. Because traditionally we think of painting as being moral or painting as being beautiful, bring beauty to the world or, or painting being as a, a, a immortalizing. But here he tells you something else. And I wanted to really ponder and, and, and conclude with this. The author, Goya, is convinced that it is as proper for painting to criticize human error and vice as for poetry and prose to do so. Although criticism is usually taken to be exclusively the business of literature, Goya. And with that, I, I come to you if you have any questions or comments. So what has been happening is, and you people have been able to watch us, but they haven't been able to interact on the comments. So we haven't been getting any comments in on Facebook. So now my hope is for all of you watching is that when we end the show, uh, that you'll be able to go back and click into the video and then we'll be able to interact then. So both uh, Jenya and I will keep an eye on posts for the next day or so to, to hopefully be able to answer the questions that you've been scribbling down and frustrated that you couldn't ask Jenya today uh, live, but we will hopefully be able to engage with you uh, after the video has ended and it goes into the recording stage and then you can make comments, you know, ongoing as a post. So, so hopefully we'll get that dialogue going back and forth. And uh, for me personally, of course, Jenya, fantastic. And thank you as always. I do uh, want to go back. You had mentioned in the beginning, the contradictions of Goya uh, and how often uh, there seems to be uh, two different Goyas at work. <laughs> And how prominent that is throughout the history of Spain since his lifetime. I was uh, reading recently how both the fascists, Franco, during the Civil War and the Republicans used Goya and his images uh, as uh, uh, to support their cause. Uh, and to be able to use the artwork of an individual artist on such polarizing uh, beliefs and sides uh, is pretty amazing. Yeah, and I think he... He, uh, in a way, embraces the demons um, and the sleep of reason. And he's saying it's impossible to be good or bad, but we must not close our eyes, even though he says eyes closed. And we must see who we are. We must, we must face our own monsters. And this way, he's not against or for. He's just showing us who we are. And that's what makes him so modern and scary and challenging. And that's why I really wanted to, you know, step up our tour today and from something very beautiful and poetic, turn into a critical and, and, and uh, you know, that critical eye, the quote that we end with, right, um, is so important. Yeah, yeah. No, he's, he's a really important artist to look at, especially as we imagine the role of the artist, right? Uh, I mean, here is a real shift from court painter uh, or painters on commissions or, or uh, assignments from the church to somebody who's painting for themselves and for uh, the world that he is witness to. Uh, 
And, uh, and he's not doing it out of bitterness. He says, I'm nothing left to wish. I've had, he had the most expensive carriage in town. He, had the, he was paid more than any painter has previously been paid by the court. He's occupying the position of Velasquez. Everybody travels to him. So he's not starting to criticize out of bitterness. Oh, look at the wealthy. He is the wealthy dominating class. He's as good as, as it gets in terms of his luxury in life. And then he's able to see past it. And so that's that's really interesting because, of course, it's easy for Van Gogh, who's struggling to have a piece of bread, to criticize, uh, right? <laughs> but we're coming from a very different position and, and to be able to let go of that and go away and rent this house outside of Madrid and hide within his visions and then allow us to see it is incredible. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Intriguing, to say the least, but, but wonderful paintings, uh, absolutely wonderful technique and just love to see in person. I mean, that, I think that's where you really gain a deeper appreciation. Uh, and I think not just as a painter, I mean, I'm always looking at the paint and, and, and the material itself, but when you see Goy's paintings and the confidence of the mark making and the, the way he handles the material is, is very hypnotic. And that's what I hope that you'll do. I hope that you will, one, look through your catalogs or up, uh, online. You can bring up the layers really closely. But two, really go out to the museum available to you here locally. For me, it's J. Paul Getty Museum. Uh, we have at least, I think, a two goes. Uh, and two paintings and many uh, drawings um, and etchings, really incredible. Um, uh, Jeff, in your area, do you have uh, Goyas? Have, Seattle does not have any Goyas to my knowledge. Maybe but some- close by, what is close? What's the closest museum that has? Um, you know, there are Goya etchings uh, around at the museums in the Pacific yeah. Northwest. Great. Actual paintings uh, on display. I think you've got to get farther east. Mm -hmm. uh, Chicago, I know, has uh, incredible. Yeah, yeah, and there are some smattered through collections. I think Texas. Uh, I can't remember whether it's Houston or Dallas. Probably Houston uh, at the Museum of Fine Art there. Boston, I believe, has Goya. Yes, and most importantly, what I wanted to say beyond looking at it and looking up close through your books, through internet, through museums, that I would love for you, whether you're a painter or not, just to try it. If you take a bit of an orange background and slap those translucent blacks on top and see the emotion you can get from paint overacting, because that is really, really interacting, because that's really what Goya is. He's a painter. He's, it's made out of the alchemy of the uh, these translucent and thick blacks glowing from the orange from the underneath and that's where the magic happens fantastic fantastic well thank you again fantastic as always and thank you everybody for joining us i sorry about the technical issues not sure what was happening on facebook why you, you weren't able to make comments but like i said afterwards it will be there living in perpetuity we will go back and monitor it and i believe you'll be able to go in and make comments after the fact about the show and and hopefully uh you took some notes and and can ask uh Genia some specific questions and she's always very good about going back and uh, responding to everything that comes up i did see that the link did show up in the comments uh, to uh, the Blick store uh, to see the colors that we talked about today, the blacks and the other colors that are mentioned historically as colors in Goya's palette. So uh, you have all the ingredients there to create your own Goya uh, if you so choose. Uh, so thank you, everybody. See again. you next time. Yeah, the, see you next time on the Invisible Museum, October. October. We'll